So welcome all to International Nurses Day Day 4, which is about looking after wellbeing and resilience. Next slide, please, Anita. Um, those of you that have been to previous sessions will have seen this session etiquette, but can you just read this and, and absorb, please? I don't think there's going to be so many of us that we can't interrupt if you want to interrupt. Next slide, please. So this is our agenda for today. I'm chairing. We've got Dr Kelly Fenton um, coming to talk first. Then we've got Gemma Abel-White and followed by Tina Smith, followed by a song for the front line with our own Sarah Latham. Next slide, please. This is the background as to why we're celebrating today. I'm sure you all know it's about Florence's birthday, so I shan't dwell on that because I'm on day four. We've been through it four times already. Next slide, please. And this is the this is um, the message from Anne Scott. Just to say thank you, really. And we can't say thank you enough to all those people that are out there doing what they're doing. And to remember everybody. Next slide, please. So for those that don't, those that don't know me, which is nobody, I've spent this year mainly redeployed during the pandemic in an assortment of different roles. So health and wellbeing has been really important this year. And I, I consider myself normally quite a resilient person, but even for me this year has been quite a challenge. And I think we've all had to find different ways of doing things and how we support our colleagues because we all want the best version of ourselves to be at work. There's also lots and lots of great things in LPT that have been happening to try and support health and wellbeing, and I'm, I'm not convinced that everybody knows about them. So hopefully after this session, you might learn something that will help health and wellbeing. And hopefully we can have a bit of discussion about how we can support each other with health and wellbeing if there's things we're not already doing. Um, next slide, please. So can I introduce Dr Kelly Fenton then, please? Hi, yeah. Thank you. Um, so first of all, I just want to say thank you for inviting me to come and talk with you today. Um, obviously, you've had lots of different sessions over the over the week, so I was really happy to come. Um, are there slides for my? Yes. Session? Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. Fantastic. So yeah. So thank you. So for those of you, I don't know. I don't think I know many people. But my name's Kelly. I'm a clinical psychologist, consultant clinical psychologist over in the rehabilitation service. So we're um, developing our pathway at the moment. So it's going to be the enhanced rehab and recovery um, pathway. And I'm the lead for that, that work. That's part of the step up to great changes. Um, but if you know the rehab service, you'll know we've got two hospitals, the Willows and Stuart House. So that's where I'm based at the Willows, but I'm uh, taken recently taken a new job to look at developing the whole whole pathway. So I wanted to come and talk to you today just um, a little bit about psychosocial support for healthcare workers during the COVID-19 pandemic um, and just to talk you through um, a model that has been developed and have a little bit of a think about some of the things that we can do at different stages of the model. I know we're quite through hopefully this part of the pandemic now and hopefully we won't get any any more um, increases in the in the virus but we might do. So I'm going to talk through that model if that's all right. Can we go to the next slide? Lovely. So as you know, um, we've had healthcare workers, particularly nursing staff, have been on the front line of this pandemic and it's been a really challenging um, year for everybody, both professionally, but also in our personal lives. It's impacted every area of our lives. And we know that healthcare staff who work through extremely traumatic and distressing pandemics can have um, both short and long term impacts on their mental health, um, which is understandable because we've been through quite a traumatic experience and actually it's still going at the moment and we don't quite know when it's going to end. They've done some research looking at um, healthcare staff in China and they did find that um, a lot of staff were traumatised and it's a very real thing that we need to think about and consider, particularly when we're thinking about supporting um, each other and supporting staff on the front line. We know that our staff have been exposed to lots of mental health burdens and I'm going to go on to talk about those. And I wanted to just talk about the different phases of the pandemic and how individual staff members and also organisations can respond differently to these stages and hopefully give people some ideas of, of how to help their well-being. Just move on please. 
Lovely. So you guys will know this already because you've literally worked through it, but the main sources of mental health burden for, for staff are the risk of contamination, so risk of contracting the virus because you're having to go out and work on the front line um, instead of you know staying at home and working from home. We've had changes to our home and our lifestyles and our routines and, and I think the most difficult thing for a lot of people has been that loss of social connections and also the things that we would normally do to de-stress and relax have been taken away so our holidays um, going to meet friends for a drink in the pub or a meal all of those things have been restricted so we, we've seen a real impact on our on our work life and our home life um, another thing that's a, a bit of a, a burden for staff is uncertainty. So people have experienced higher work demands and lower control. Um, and though those two in combination can in increase levels of stress. If we have increased levels of stress, I know I'm preaching to the to the, <laughs> the choir here, you know all this, but you know, if we've got increased level of stress, then our immune system can be affected. So that can be weaker um, and we can pick up other, other viruses as, as well as obviously the, the main one that we're concerned about. People have been exhausted. These things affect people's sleep. Lots of um, our colleagues have been redeployed. You might have been redeployed as well. Um, and that brings with it a whole host of challenges because you're having to work in a new area with new colleagues, you know, at a time where everything's so unstable. So that's a real difficult situation. Um, what we found in inpatient services as well is that our patients have had to be restricted. You know, we can't do as many leaves. People can't go out into the local community. Things are the shops and the, the gyms and things that people would access are all closed down. But also they're not being able to see their family members. Um, and we've, we've tried to work with that and to, to introduce different ways of people to engage with with people outside of the hospital. But it's been really tough and things like that can affect um, relational security. So if um, the normal way um, of coping as a patient is that you see your family go out every Sunday and you can't do that and you're stuck in this hospital, it can increase uh, anxiety, frustration and, and can lead to deterioration of mental health difficulties, which impact then in fact, um, affect the wards and the staff. So we've seen that as well. So that's something to be really, really mindful of, I think. And also if somebody has got any pre-existing mental health vulnerabilities, including previous trauma, that can be exacerbated during times of these sort of pandemics. Thank you. So I want to talk briefly through this phased model. So the Intensive Care Society in the UK, they um, offer helpful ways of thinking about maintaining staff health before, during and after the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, they've, they've done some work prior to, to pandemics, but what's happened is this model is it makes a lot of sense and it's been expanded to incorporate uh, mental health expertise. So I wanted to just talk through that model um, with you today. Um, and it's really important that organisations as well as individuals have an understanding of this kind of the phases of pandemics and what we can do to support each other and ourselves throughout. Lovely. So here's the model. So there's four phases. And as I said, um, there's considerations from an individual's perspective. So what can I do? What can I do to support myself and my immediate team? And then the organisation. So what can the organisation do to help help its members, its um, employees? Um, and the model sort of talks about recognition, so understanding what's going on for you, understanding your thoughts and feelings, and then thinking about how can I respond and how can I build my resilience? So there's four phases, the preparation phase, the pre-phase, so that's where there's no cases in your area of work, but um, there are in the country, etc. Then you've got your initial and your core phase, which is the phase we've just come out of. So you've got your clinical case, but then they start to have multiple cases. And then you've got the end and longer term phase, which is, I feel, what we're moving into. So this is the immediate aftermath and longer term. Um, and I guess what we found in this pandemic is there's been spikes, so we can go around this model several times. Thank you. So a little bit about the preparation phase. So this is before um, before it all sort of enters our workplace, really. So in this phase, they talk about the need for self-reflection. So knowing your own needs and your strengths and sharing them with someone that you trust. So in your team, your colleagues, um, so you can plan and prepare. Um, there's a need to have a personal understanding of our triggers and our stress. Um, so we probably know what these are, but it 
it's about thinking about them and thinking how we might be able to manage some of these things. Within the workplace, it talks about encouraging supervision and discussion within your teams about well-being and really trying to up your well-being in preparation for um, the difficult time that you know is coming. With regards to the organisation, leaders should have an understanding and um, that their needs, they should understand the needs of their workforce. So if there's existing mental health needs, if people have care responsibilities, we need to think about protected characteristics and how any changes might affect different groups because they're going to affect people in different ways. And I think the most important thing is about having compassionate leadership and a clear message that it's OK not to be OK. So we don't expect everybody to just be absolutely stoic and just to get through it. Actually, we need to recognise that that actually this is traumatic and this is challenging and, and we're going to everybody's going to have ups and downs and that's fine and that's normal. And, and we should be thinking about that. And again, in nursing in general, we need to think about sort of proactive rather than reactive strategies, if at all possible. OK, then moving on to the pre phase. So this is where you've got sort of an anticipation of the of the event. So it's just starting to to creep into your or area or, you know, it's, it's starting on the news, etc. And what we know about anticipatory anxiety is that you actually thinking about how bad it's going to be is often worse than what actually happens and it can make people feel quite overwhelmed. So there's just a few key things to do in this phase, really. So I talk about tackling one thing at a time, focusing on your mental well-being, identify positive coping strategies and techniques that you might have and talking, talking to your colleagues and people that you trust is essential, um, as we would always advocate. Um, with regards to the team, you can do sort of grounding techniques and so maybe up your team meetings. I know it's something that we did in the psychology team across adult mental health is that we started having weekly team meetings um, rather than the monthly. And it was just a time for us to check in, see how everything was going, um, check in on each other. We have seen massive changes in how we use um, virtual tools during this pandemic and obviously we're doing this over MS Teams. So it's thinking about can we use tools, how can we use tools to keep people safe, um, to keep us effective, to keep um, uh, our services running when, when things are difficult. Um, as I said previously, we need to consider the protective characteristics of, of staff and actually, you know, if we're redeploying people, if we're changing our environments, um, if our environments go to red environments or, you know, how is that going to affect different people? Because people have different characteristics, different backgrounds, um, different responsibilities outside of work. So we need to be mindful of that um, and being as flexible as we can. So the organisation should think about flexible working and changes to environments to enable people to continue to work safely. So the next stage, so this is the stage I think um, we've just sort of come through um, and uh, as I said we don't, we can't predict what's happening in the future but it's, it's a lot calmer obviously now. So the initial and the core phases, so this has the highest psychological risk because this is the phase where you're you're writing it so you've got lots of cases or cases and your, your work environment has changed. So these are just a list of things that um, is recommended for people to to think about and to develop during this phase to help um, help with your mental health well-being. So in how enhance self compassion. So we become really critical of ourselves during high times of stress. So it's about being compassionate to yourself and people often struggle with this. We're often incredibly compassionate to everybody else. But when it comes to yourself, um, you know, we can be quite tough critics. So one of the things we talk about is thinking about what you would say to your friend in this situation, what would you say to a colleague in this situation, and then um, thinking that towards yourself, so bringing that towards yourself. Um, you would have heard of mindfulness. People have found mindfulness really helpful during times of stress. Um, we've got apps such as head, Headspace and we've got, you know, um, free or reduced apps, haven't we? So and people have found those really, really useful. Grounding techniques are really, really good as well. If you're on a very busy ward, if you're working on a red ward, if it's really stressful, um, bringing yourself back to, to the moment and just breathing and giving yourself time. Um, a challenging one, as we as I mentioned earlier, is, is this sort of work life life balance. So we usually have this. We usually, you know, a lot of people are very good at it, but that our home life has been changed, hasn't it, during the pandemic? 
but trying to get that balance and maintain that balance and anybody who's been working at home i've been working at home uh, as well as working on the ward um, is really difficult and at the beginning i really struggled to get that boundary in um because you're at home you know and how do you separate your home and your work and how do you make sure you don't overwork um so getting that right is really important social media making sure that you're accessing credible sources um, and also um, people have found it really helpful to limit the, the amount of social media or media that they're consuming during the height of the pandemics um, because obviously it can trigger lots of stress and anxiety social connection is really important it's it's central but again we've been um, isolated from some of our family and peers but it's it's looking at how we can keep that social connection as best we can Healthy living strategies are always going to be advocated for people with mental health and wellbeing, but during um, the pandemic, uh, things like exercise, diet, really helps with your sleep. Um, positive coping strategies, so alcohol um, might be best to limit if you can, um, just so you know you're you're getting the best sort of physical health care you can, physical care you can. And then routine, where it's possible. And again, everything changed. I know I was um, at home with two young children for several months, which was incredibly challenging. But having a routine and maintaining that where possible is, is really um, important. So those are um, things about what we can do and think about ourselves self-care and well-being but there's, there's other things that the organisation could do as well which is advocated in this model so leaders and organisations should share timely accurate and evidence-based information um, on the virus and their response and I think we've seen that with this organisation actually I think that they've been very good at getting information out in our um, Covid briefs etc leaders should be visible and approachable um, should be a role model to staff. So if we think about the changes in our environments and, for example, wearing PPE, so making sure that leaders and managers and senior people are, are adhering to all the policies and wearing the PPE, etc. Um, ensure regular communication, but also what's important is psychological debrief is not recommended at this stage uh, and evidence suggests that it can actually make things worse. So the focus should be on peer support and compassionate leadership. OK, now moving on to the end phase. So I think we're tentatively coming into this phase now. Um, it's really important as we move forward to stay connected to colleagues and can continue to share our experiences that we've had jointly um, and to understand that feeling distressed or upset is normal and totally understandable. We've just been through a horrendous time. It's really important to give yourself and your brain time to process the experience. And as I previously said, we shouldn't be doing any psychological debrief. We should be doing something called watchful waiting. And this is because um, people who experience trauma, the majority of them go on to not develop any, any uh, long term symptoms, any PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, anything like that. Um, so it's about giving you time, yourself time and space to recover. Um, continue with your self-care and self-compassion, really important. And think about that it, it might it may be over but it's not forgotten so it's not about oh that part's gone let's get back to normal actually no we're all changed we're all different because of this um, collective experience um, let's make sure we remember that and have the opportunity to talk about it if we need to lovely okay so in conclusion i just wanted to say that we've experienced really distressing and challenging time and it's it has been it's been a collective experience but it's been different obviously for individuals we need time to process our experience so give yourself time to to breathe to stop to think about what's happened um, and i would highly recommend self-compassion um, and I am I, sorry my, my model I use in psychology is um, compassion focused therapy so I am biased but yeah but looking after yourself being kind to yourself is really important That's, any questions or thoughts or feedback or wow that, wow, was, really that was really interesting makes a lot makes of sense well. thank you uh, Emma, you've got your hand up. Yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry. I was tied to my way. So, so I, I loved it. I, I, loved thought, it. I thought it was really it's informative really going through the different, different phases. Sorry, we've got a lot of um, And it's OK to, to not be OK. Um, mm -hmm. I think that is so important. One of the themes um, 
Kelly throughout the whole week, I mean, including me blubbing, because I think, you know, we get very, this has been a really reflective time in terms of nursing and, you know, contribution throughout yeah. the pandemic, but being kind to yourself and having that self-compassion and how we look after each other has been something that's come through at the end of every session. Um, so I, th I think, you know, fantastic. I know for my own, I'll share one of my own experiences that I've reflected on. I was an avid reader. I would always read every night before I went to sleep. I would get through, you know, if I'm on holiday, I can get through six books in a week. Yeah. I absolutely love reading and the power of stories. Since the pandemic, I've been re re trying to read the same book uh, for probably, it's been a laughing, uh, standing joke for a year because my brain yeah. has been so busy. Yeah. I've yeah. not been able to, um, de I've not been able to, even despite my best efforts, empty my, you know, do that mindfulness before. Um, so I think, um, but yes, loved it. Thank you very much. I've, I've shut up and let others. <laughs> Thank you, Emma. So that's really helpful to hear your reflection and I'm exactly the same. So I read loads of books. I read 20 books last year and this year, well, the year before the pandemic and last year, I'm just getting to the end of, my, of one. And I, I, I too, I just don't, I just can't do it. And it's, it's a real change, actually. But do you know what I did? I downloaded the Calm app and I listened to stories on Calm and I listened to audiobooks and I listened to the sleep stories. So the audiobooks have saved me. I've had about 10 audiobooks this year, but I can't quite read, but I can do the audiobooks. So yeah, so thank you for Try sharing that. that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's really, I would I would highly recommend it. It's really good. Yeah, lovely. And um, Sarah, do you have your hand up? Oh. I'm mute. <laughs> I was just going to say thank you. Really interesting. I think um, just from today, actually, I've been on the way talking to one of the members of staff who was shielding, one of our nurses shielding for the year. And actually, I didn't recognise she looked very different, lost a lot of weight, but very definitely talking about how the impact on her mental health and shielding and losing her purpose for the year uh, and I suppose there's that whole aspect that probably we would not have really and just standing next to her and saying gosh you look so, so different um, you lost, you know she lost a lot of discipline with it we probably wouldn't have had that conversation a year ago um, you know you would have done a private one to one, but not just me. Oh, how are you? You know, and she just learned how to be out. And, and it, it, you were right, it's that peer support that we need. And but she's she just feeling back in, she's got purpose back in. Yeah. Lovely. So you broke up a little bit there, Sarah, but I think we got the gist of it. And the, the shielded, um, cohort is really interesting so in my service we actually set up a community team to help us with discharges and it's been going for the last year so we set it up during covid as partly as a response and we initially um staffed the team with shielded individuals and so we've been thinking really hard about how we um include people working from home how we can build a team with people who are at home and, and we've done a lot of work around that um but yeah, it, it's it's really impacted and people at home, you know, there's people who haven't seen people for six, eight, ten months, you know, they've been and my um, I'll share with you, my husband was a shielded individual and, you know, and, and he hasn't been out, hadn't gone out the house really properly for, for a year. So it's a massive impact, isn't it? So people working on the front line, but also people who, who can't do that job and really want to and have to sort of stay out of society. Yeah. So thank you. Asha, you have your. Thank you. I really enjoyed that, Kelly, and, and I think some of it resonates with me and I can take something back to my staff network as well because they're, they're from the Ben group. But for me, it's those members, those particular members say, but I don't I don't want to take any holiday because I can't go anywhere. And, <laughs> the, and it's like for me to say, well, actually, you need a break. Yeah because a break away from work and I think we were talking about this a bit earlier of how long should that break be because from my own personal experience two weeks 
of, of, of coming back to emails was as bad as going away for a day. <laughs> so, it was, you know, if you want to take a chunk of time, then take and don't feel guilty about it, because I used to feel really guilty that there was one day in the week that I didn't work and, I, and I'd come back on the Monday and I think I've missed all this. So, you know, it is gone are the times where you think you just have a long weekend because normality of work is is it normal is different now we're on a reset so you know i do encourage staff to say think about what time you want and even if it is you can't go away it's time away and brain space away from work and then the other thing i wanted to say was because i was shielding and i've taken myself out of shielding because i've had both injections and everything else however it's the reaction of some of the staff are you all right to come out? Are you not anxious? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking I'm not anxious, but I'm not a, normally I'm an anxious person, but not in this case because I, I want to go out because I thrive that company because I don't have that company at home. Yeah. So I want that. But it's other people's perceptions of what I should be doing or not be yeah. doing. Yeah, thank you. That's a really interesting reflection, isn't it? And people assume it's it's been one way for people, but actually your experience is, is very different and, and you just don't know. And people, are, I know the people um, in our team that we're shielding are absolutely itching to get back and feel totally confident and just want to get back in and, and see colleagues and be part of the system again and part of society. So, yeah, thank you. Oh, Leslie, I think you're on mute. Oh. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Kelly. That was really interesting, but I think we could talk about this all day and I'm, I'm mindful I need to get Gemma on. So Gemma, can, we, can I introduce you, please? Uh, well, Gemma, you can introduce yourself. Yes, probably. So, yeah, I'm Gemma Abelwhite. So I'm um, the Listening into Action and Health and Wellbeing Lead for LPT. I'm also a mental health nurse by background, but it's been a while. Um, and I realise I, re I could talk for England, but I realise we've, we've got limited time, so I'm going to try and keep keep to um, time here. So next slide, please, Anita. So I'm going to run through the health and wellbeing um, presentation that I've been taking around the trust, and it, it was a shortened version that I sent in, and I think it's going to be slightly shorter again. However, um, I am more than happy to come to Teams and run through the longer version to help people um, be aware of the results resources, what's available within the trust, you know, lots of what you've talked about, Kelly, I've been itching to kind of put my hand up and go, there's this, there's this. So I'm, I'd love to come and talk to teams more about what's available. Um, Anita, I know, is going to put um, the presentation somewhere that you can all access it because I've put this together with links to try and make things really accessible for you. So without further ado, I shall move on. So the health and wellbeing team um, from the people plan, um, it advocated that, that we have each organisation have a health and wellbeing guardian and Cathy Ellis is ours and she's a, a great advocate advocate for that. And her, hopefully you've seen from the Wellbeing Wednesdays newsletter, she will put an, a message in each week. So just to introduce her role as the health and wellbeing guardian, Catherine Burt. Deputy, Deputy Director of Human Resources and OD. There's myself and Alicia Barbell, who's been supporting me. And she's been one of the new starters for the, with the organisation from the start of the pandemic. She's been working at home and really struggling to get a grip with, you know, what LPT is about and what the staff want. So she has done a really good job. Next slide, please. So we have a stra uh, strategic approach. We realise that it needs review with along with lots of things. It's been put to one side. It hasn't taken priority. Catherine and I will be looking at that and we'll be building in a lot of um, the people promise, the actions from the people promise and um, also some comments from a senior leadership forum that we um, sought some advice from the leaders there. But at the moment it sits under three headings. And so I've tried to put this presentation together under those three headings, but health and wellbeing doesn't sit under headings. So, you know, a lot of them, a lot of them will go under two or, you know, I might have got them under the wrong one. What was important to me was that staff knew where to get help. So next slide, please. So, as I said, I won't be going through each of these, but I will be picking out some of the really resor um, useful resources that I think you need to be signposted to. And I will just say that Step Up to Great, Our Future, Our Way, Trust Values, they're all about overarching principles to support our health and well-being within the tr trust. So having elements of that within each of those. Um, 
staff support groups. I think it's really important that staff know that they are there for them, that they're where staff can go to feel safe, seek support. Um, so um, Leona Knott is contactable to um, look at what staff support groups there are available. I'm flying through this. <laughs> Appraisals. Hopefully everyone has had an appraisal and will have seen that there's a health and wellbeing grid at the start of that. We're doing some work around that because that's encouraging wellbeing conversations, but we really want to make sure that and from the people promise that people have um, wellbeing conversations on a more regular basis. So we're, we're currently putting together some um, resources to support and assist wellbeing conversations for managers and individuals. So you'll see that coming out but they should be taking place. We really encourage leaders, managers to um, have conversations with your staff specifically around their well-being. Um, I'd love people to click onto the link with the people guides. So that takes you to our NHS people and there are a, there is a whole wealth of resources to support um, you if you're struggling in any way. But the people guides are um, 10 to 20 minute guides and just for example, they, they have um, topics such as good sleep, personal resilience, they've got things around financial well-being and managing stress. So I, I'd really encourage you to go to that link and have a look at those guides, but also to look wider around our, our NHS People website because there are so many things there that I think you'll, you'd be surprised what's available to support you. Also within that, there's the leadership support circles. So they're guidance and tools in themed online sessions and they're based around the 10 principles of leading with compassion. So if you're a leader, you may want to go and have a look at those and encourage um, those sort of um, techniques with your with your teams. And I've put a link on there for coaching and mentoring opportunities as well. So that will take you to the health and wellbeing website and you can see what opportunities are available to you there. Next slide, please. So moving on to intervention and prevention. So yes, Amica, we've got our confidential. Um, gosh, I've, it's because I shortened it. The, the telephone number isn't on there. My apologies. Um, but that, the link there will take you to the website. So yes, we've got a confidential um, staff helpline that you can ring up for counselling and support. The website has, a, again, um, a number of resources which are there to support you. So we've got emotional resilience workshops. We've got some um, they are mindfulness eight week um, courses that you can work through um, at your own pace on the Amica website. Also available is Silver Cloud and they've got some resilience, um, resilience based tools that you can access through there. So there's the link there that I've put on for the Amica website and apologies that the um, telephone number isn't on there. It's me changing it around trying to shorten things. As so I've just moved down, um, Kelly mentioned mindfulness. We have regular drop in mindful, mindfulness courses every Wednesday as part of the Wellbeing Wednesdays. And we also have an eight week course that's now being advertised. Um, so you can let us know if you want to book onto that. It starts at the beginning of June. Um, mental health first aid training that was launched yesterday. So I've um, through NHS charities, we've bought a lot of different um, mental health first aid courses. So we, yes, there's the mental health first aid courses. So we've got a number of spaces available on there. There's six courses for people to do that training. But there's also things around um, skills for managers, uh, mental health awareness. There's a, an hour long presentation. So please go and have a look on ULEARN and book onto the courses there just for us. So they're not going to be snapped up really quickly because I think we've struggled to access some of those courses previously. Um, I will mention the Mental Health and Wellbeing Hub and there's um, a slide on that so you get the details of how to make contact with them. There's a Public Health England put on a free course, a psychological first aid training course, which I think is really useful. It um, runs over three weeks, um, an hour a week and that I, I've done it. It didn't take an hour a week, so it's um, it's really helpful um, in increasing your awareness and, and um, confidence in providing um, psychosocial support to people affected with COVID-19. So there's the link for that. Next slide, please. I said that I'd mentioned the Mental Health and Wellbeing Hub for staff. So this is for all staff across LLR, for health and social care staff. Um, if they need help, there's the telephone number there. You can self-refer. There's also a website and the link is there. So the website's really working progress. It's building, but there are the resources there that can support um, many elements of your well-being. So hopefully if you need extra help, there's another avenue for you. Next slide, please. So some other additional resources which we've made accessible to us. 
We've got the NHS staff support line, so another confidential line that you can ring if you're struggling, need support. If you feel that um, texting is easier for you, you, there's a text line available, so you can just text in that number for support. The Samaritans have put on a specific line for NHS and social care workers, so there's the number there. Project 5 um, is a brilliant um, resource. And this offers free confidential wellbeing um, support. It's self-referral, so you can click onto that link and you will have they'll do a, an assessment and you get access to either three counselling sessions, three wellbeing sessions or three coaching sessions. And I have known someone access that and they said how, how good it was, really, really helpful to them. Um, we also have, so we know that some people have been hit financially um, over the past 15 months. Um, Money Advice Service have um, budded up with, for a specific helpline for our NHS staff, so the telephone number is on there. And um, Hospice UK are supporting a telephone line for people that are suffering um, with bereavement or need support in any way, then there's telephone numbers there. Next slide, please. So promoting a healthy lifestyle. So I'm really hoping that people have heard about Wellbeing Wednesday now, that there's a regular email each week, that we're trying to just get as much information out to people through that. There's also a programme of activities, and I'll come on to that within, with the next slide. Don't change it, I didn't say next slide. Um, but just to run through, so we have a health and wellbeing calendar. Each month we um, put together a newsletter with supportive resources within that, and they're all stored on the health and wellbeing um, section within StaffNet, so you can go back to those at any point. We've got 250 um, health and wellbeing champions that hopefully share those calendars out to people across the, um, across the trust. So within their teams, they'll share those um, out there. If you don't know of a um, health and wellbeing champion and you could allocate one for your team, then please let me know. At the moment, following the um, festival, we've got some more yoga sessions. So laughter yoga, that's we've got three sessions of that starting. Um, we had one session this week. We've got one in June and July. The link to join that is there. We've also got yin and nidra yoga. So five, uh, four sessions of that throughout May. Um, that's on a Monday night. We've got a few spaces left for sleep therapy yoga. The booking details are there. I mentioned the mindfulness course and following really good uptake and some comments back from the festival where we had hen picked to come and talk to us about menopause. Um, and the com comments were that they wanted some for staff and leaders and managers to kind of help make them more aware of the um, issues and support staff. So we've got some more that I've booked that actually now. So that's September the 8th. Um, I will be advertising that out shortly, but there'll be some for um, staff that are experiencing menopause and difficulties. And there'll also be sessions for managers and leaders to book on to. And the toxic heroism um, workshop that we had technical difficulties on the day of the festival, that's being rerun next week. The link to it, if you want to join it, join it, please do the links there. Next slide, please. I was aiming to be finished by now, so I'm ploughing on. Wellbeing Wednesday session, so the virtual common room. If you just want to meet with other people, if you're lonely, if you're struggling to connect with others, then go to that room. Either me or Alicia Bar will be there and we just wait to see who joins us and have lunch or coffee or a chat or anything. Wellbeing activities, you can see each Wednesday at, the, at 12.30, there's a different activity. Again, they're all recorded and put onto StaffNet. And then the drop in mindfulness session is um, has been running for some time, 1 to 1.30. We don't video that. That's just for staff to access and just find a moment of peace and calm in perhaps a, a really busy day. Next slide, please. We mentioned apps that are available and they are available. So I put on the dates because um, they were all made available from last March and we've kind of had those eked out a little bit more. So we've got Headspace now. If you were to download that, you'll get a free year's access to Headspace, for instance. So you need to download that before December 21. So I've put the dates on each of the apps there and I won't run through each of them because I think we'll be just running out of time. If apps, apps aren't your thing, there's two podcasts that are available on there from our Leicester Hospital chaplains and any difficulties at downloading apps, then there's the link at the bottom that um, will support you to download them. You just need to use your NHS email. Next slide, please. 
So on StaffNet, I've mentioned that they've got we've got all the old the newsletters that are there. There's some um, further resources to support you. Um, we've also got an art gallery if you're an artist, if you're if you're a photographer and you want to just um, submit something there. But if you want to five minutes downtime, just looking at something, if you can't get away from your screen, but you just need to stop working, then there's hopefully a, another way to stop working. And the COVID-19 thank you card. I had a couple of these and I think we're still finding we do still need to thank one another. And I don't think you can um, underestimate how good it makes you feel. So being able to send thank yous to one another. Um, next slide, please. Oh, we did it. I was a couple of minutes. I was sorry, Leslie. I am more than happy to take questions. Um, you can email me for more resources. I will come and talk to your teams and I'll stop there. there. <laughs> a race through. Well, well done, Gemma. <laughs> I think everybody said that the comments seems to say, be saying what you said they'd say. They didn't realise there was so much. No, no, there is definitely. such a massive amount of stuff going on. Yeah, I really want to get it out there to staff. So if I can come to any teams to let people know, then please invite. Yeah, me. Really good. Um, without further ado, can I bring Tina on then, please? So welcome, Tina Smith, who is a hi there. Who's a band six community team lead for the Kibworth and Marker Harbour District Nursing Team, and last year was the senior band five at Rutland. So that was just. Tina's picture book. Can we have Tina on live? Live from Market Harbour. You haven't got any slides, have you, Tina? No, no. 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 So, t so just take that one down then. Yeah. So, Tina, live from Market Harbour. Over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, as Leslie said, I'm Tina, um, and I'm here to talk to you about my experience, um, basically the beginning of the pandemic um, and how as a team um, and as a new leader of the team, um, we dealt with it. Um, I think initially, initially we, th we saw it as a challenge. Initially, it was something exciting, um, something different, something we were going to get our teeth stuck into. But I think pretty soon we realised it was a little bit more than that. Um, within Rutland, it's, it's very rural. Um, lots of people kind of live there with their families and things. Um, and it was a big concern. And we had at one time, I think across the hub, we had 17 members of staff off shielding or um, with a potential COVID awaiting test results and all that kind of thing. So, and as I've heard said before, community nursing didn't stop. We still carried on with our lists. We still carried on with our visits. And if anything, the acuity got, it got harder. It got a lot harder. Um, and it was quite difficult because we didn't see each other as much. So in that respect, um, you know, WhatsApp and phone calls to each other and stuff really came into its own just for us to kind of stay and be the team. I think we had a few moments of kind of hysterical room full of nurses, socially distanced, of course. Um, and as the kind of the new leader, um, it was it was kind of up to me to calm it down a little bit. Um, and inside that was difficult because my husband had just been diagnosed with prostate cancer as well. So it was kind of like I'm trying to keep it together for the team, but I've got to try and keep it together for my family as well. Um, I mean, the ICC were absolutely fantastic. I had fantastic support from the DN at Melton, fantastic support from our matron, Donna Bottrell. Um, and in Rutland, there's some really, really fantastic um, experienced nurses. So what we didn't do well, I think essentially, was everybody freaked out. But I think that's to be expected. You know, this was kind of an unprecedented event, something we, we, we just didn't know we would see in our lifetime. So I think the fact, um, I think I had to kind of promote people taking a little bit ownership of their own safety. Um, obviously, you know, the trust was updating us daily and provided us with the PPE and things. Um, so there was an element of that. I think what we did well um, is we adapted quite well using the teams and using the WhatsApp groups and it made us more of a team because we were actually checking on each other more. We're actually ensuring that we were OK and, and the guys that were at home that were shielding 
um, and were still doing, you know, admin bits for us and stuff, you know, I would keep in touch with them daily um, just so they still felt part of the team because a lot of them said we just don't it doesn't feel great to us because you guys are out there dealing with all of this and it's such a huge thing and here we are sat at home but of course they were still working and still an integral part of the team um there was never any doubts about that i think moving on um i think in kind of the next life if this kind of happened again um what i would say is people need to read their emails I don't know we get millions of them every day, but that daily COVID email, the daily update from the trust is really, really important. And initially, even I was like, oh, they're bombarding us with these messages, but there's so much in there that we need to know so much. And I think as the new leader, um, at the time at Rutland, um, I was kind of doing a lot of training towards my band six. So the healthy conversations um, was absolutely fantastic. Um, it taught me a lot of um, kind of coping strategies, how to deal with the staff, you know, how to bring us together as a team. Um, also, um, I did the first steps into leadership, was which was also really, really good. Um, so yeah, that's that's basically it, my experience of working through the pandemic. But like I say, community nursing, it didn't stop. It didn't stop. Nothing changed for us apart from the PPE and the amount of patients we saw. So yeah, that's my experience. Well done, well, Tina. So any any questions, anybody? Or comments? I so want to ask a question. Go on then, Emma. I, I, I'm very conscious though, chatty cat. Thank you, Tina. Thank you for sharing your experience. And it sounds like you had such a cha challenging time being a new leader and, 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 and with your husband. And, 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 and it was really just very inspirational to share that story, I think, and the, and the real impact. And I'm so glad you found a way to support each other at work. And I think have been somebody who worked in the ICC, it's nice to know that staff could feel that we were real and we were there to try and give yeah. support and advice. Just thinking about what you said about emails, because I'm always really aware that particularly now, you know, that is one of our main ways of, of communicating. And I guess it's top tips, really, in, in terms of, you know, you leading a team and I mean, you're saying, you know, we need to try and get people to read their emails, but are there any other thoughts, you know, from the team in terms of best ways of engaging and getting those messages out? Or is it just trying to focus everything through that channel? I mean, we did um, once um, the DN came back um, after being off, um, they actually, we actually introduced a every hour, every day there was kind of an hour set aside oh, by teams. Um, so basically we could go through all of that kind of stuff. So, you know, latest updates on PPE, latest updates on, uh, you know, shielding and things like that. And also, how are you feeling? Are you OK with all this? So that was, you know, that was a huge help because we knew that every day, even though we couldn't be together in the offices, you know, and have these conversations, we could have that hour yeah. together virtually and um, and yeah, kind of pass all that information across. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. It, it must have been really difficult to you because I know the Rutland team particularly are a very sociable team, aren't they? There was, there was a place yeah. you could always go to get a coffee and a biscuit because the Rutland team are, are all like mother hens. They've all got, they always bring copious amounts of food in. Um, so so it, was, it was always a good place to go to see somebody or and to catch up and to have nobody in that office must have felt a bit bleak. Yeah, to be honest with you, Leslie, they're absolutely fabulous. Um, and sorry, I'm getting a bit emotional now. Um, we, I think we all got each other through it. I think we really did. Um, and they are, every team is special, but they will always be special to me because I joined as a newly qualified there. Um, but yeah, yeah, they are a very social team. Um, and it was a struggle. It really was. But we really pulled it together. We all worked really hard to pull it together to kind of, you know, check in on each other um, and make it work. 
Yeah, but no, the Tina was one of my perceptees who's done really well. Thank you. I'm not taking any credit, but. Um, um, so, uh, so without further ado then, has anybody got else anything else you want to say? Because I want to part, we've got just under four minutes left and the, Sarah's video takes three minutes and something. So um, next slide, Tina, um, Anita. So now I've got you all crying. That, that pack, packs a bit of a punch, doesn't it? So, Emma, are you weeping somewhere? <laughs> What's wrong with me this week? <laughs> <laughs> Of course I'm crying. I mean, it's the power of music as well, isn't it? You yeah. know, and I think it just brings back emotions, doesn't it, for yeah. all of us. Anyway, I can't speak. You know what I'm like. <laughs> anyway, I, I, I just thought that was wonderful. I think it's a, a great celebration. And also, like you say, so it's that how some of you have kept some activity going when hobbies have been stopped. 
and it's so important. Uh, anyway, we've managed to overrun by five minutes, but thank you all very much for your time. Hope been you've been great. The session. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Thank you. Thank you, thank Kelly you. and Gemma. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks all. See you. Bye. 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 Bye.